I am the recording is started. <clears throat> All right, so there we go. We are ready to go. Um, we have about one half of the class here. I have no idea what's happening to the other half, but that's not my job to know. <laughs> so we're going to have to get started because you know, otherwise we won't have enough time to cover all the material. Thank you. And I'll keep reminding people, there's another door. There's one more door over here. Try this one. This one stays unlocked. That one does not. As much as I want to get that door to unlock for all of you, it does not stay unlocked. So use this one. I suspect I have to say that like three more times within the next 15 minutes. Like. I thought now. it was the opposite the past few weeks. That one was always open and that one was locked. No, this one stays unlocked now. I don't know why. Yeah. All right, so if that one does not unlock, try this one. Okay? <clears throat> there are two doors to this room. All right. So we're going to continue with our discussion. Um... We have not met for another five days, and then before that, an entire week. So that is not helping, okay? You know, as much as you know, we like, oh man, you know, we don't have class. Yeah, we don't have class during a semester is not a good thing. Um, so where we are at right now is we are done talking about binary addition. So this entire module about binary addition is all done. Yeah, you know, we are we completely covered the entire thing. So if you go back here, I'm pretty sure some of you still remember this crazy expression. Yes, I hope so. All right, so we are done with addition, so it's time to move on to subtraction. And I'm gonna do the same thing as with addition. We'll start with base 10 subtraction, and then we'll extract the structure of subtraction. And then we'll move on and talk about how to turn all those things into binary form and then we'll talk about how to make it go faster, and then we'll be done, okay? Um, the Tuesday-Thursday class moved exceptionally fast last Thursday. Uh, I kept trying to pause and ask whether there are questions or not, and I kept getting no questions whatsoever. Um, so that means, you know, we have a train going down a slope without any brakes. That would be me. So if you guys want to slow down the train, you got to ask questions, okay? Or you can just ask for some more time. It's like, okay, can, can we think about this a little bit more? You know, that's fine too. All right, so we're going to get started here. And subtraction is down here. All right, so I just want to show you where to find the subtraction module, okay? This is the subtraction module. It is considerably shorter compared to the addition module because you know, what we do you know, with this module is we still use a lot of parallel you know, as the, the same way that we did with addition except this time we apply that to subtraction. So now let me start up my tablet. Okay, where's my terminal? There we go. All right, so we'll start up the tablet and I have to find a way to open it where I need it to be so that I don't have to move it every single time but that's okay it's not a too big of a deal all right so we're gonna start with subtraction so I'll give you guys an example first okay of base 10 multi-digit subtraction so we'll start with I don't know let's do a 209 and we'll subtract from it, um, let's see, I'm trying to think of 200 and hmm, 13, okay, that's good. Okay, there we go. 
So this is the base 10 subtraction. You know, so I'm pretty sure most of you just looking at the value, you already know the answer is negative four. Okay, but that's not how we are going to approach this. Okay, we're not we're not just going to eyeball this. We'll work on this step by step, and then in the process, we'll go. We'll, we'll later on we'll go back and look at the process and then extract the structure of how we get it done. So once again, we have a row called x. We have a row called y. X is also called the minuend, and uh, y is also called the subtrahend. Okay, so those are the terms that, that are applicable to subtraction. I'm pretty sure there are equivalent terms in addition, but in addition, because it is commutative, it is not as important to figure out which one is x and which one is y. But in subtraction, because there it is not commutative, so it is important to understand the name of each one. And then we still have a row called Q, okay? So Q is still here. Then we have a row called T, which is take, okay, take away, which is another way to say borrow, because we use B to mean the function. And then the last row is called D for difference. So this terminology is completely just, you know, unique to this class, because I just need a way to label each and every single row so I can refer to these specific rows. <clears throat> On top of that, um, let me pick a different color, let's say green. We still have digit zero, digit one, digit two, and digit three. So we, you know, this is, this should be nothing new, okay? Because this has been the way we named the columns since the very beginning of this class. And then the borrow bit or the T bit of zero is going to be assumed a zero because we are not stacking subtractions. So this is how we set up the question. So the first thing is, um, what do we put here? In other words, what is nine minus three? Okay, that should not be a difficult question. What is nine minus three in base 10? Six, okay, that's an easy one. And then what is six minus zero? That's another six. Okay, that's an easy one. All right, so now we get on to something that's a little bit more challenging. What is zero minus one in base 10? in a multi-digit subtraction. As much as we want to say negative one, it's not going to help. So what, what, what is zero minus one? It's a nine, very good, okay? It is a nine because zero is less than one. Because zero is less than one, we cannot, we cannot do that subtraction. But we can do the subtraction if we borrow a 10 from the next digit, in this case from digit two. So once you borrow a 10, then we have 10. 10 minus 1 is a 9. Okay, so that means you know, I also have to remember to put a 1 here because I just borrowed a 1 from the next column, which from the perspective of column 1, we just borrowed a 10. Is that okay? Does everybody still remember the basic concepts of multi-digit subtraction and know what, I'm just, what I just talked about? All right, very good. Okay, so now we have, so now we have to figure out what goes here. So what goes here is whether we ended up with a borrow situation with column zero. Column zero did not end up with a borrow situation because we have nine minus three. Nine is greater than or equal to three. We don't have a borrow, and then we also have six minus zero, in which case six is also greater than or equal to zero. So we did not end up with a borrow there either. So that means, you know, we don't need a borrow. We don't have a borrow, and therefore the borrow for column one is a zero. Are we doing okay so far with this? All right. <clears throat> All right, so moving on, okay? So now we have a nine minus a zero, which is a nine. And then we go to the third, uh, the uh, column two, we have two minus two, which is a zero. And then we have zero minus one, which once again is a nine with a borrow of one. So the answer is 996. That's not possible. 209 minus 213. How can that possibly be 996? It's because we have a borrow of a thousand. That extra borrow bit here which, is, which belongs to digit three, or T3 in this case, 
means that we owe one thousand. You have nine hundred and ninety-six dollars in your pocket, but you owe one thousand dollars. So your net worth is still negative four. Is that okay? Does that make sense? All right. Okay. So now what we want to do is to look at this example and ask the question of how do we figure out each and every single digit. So we first start with the Q's. So I'm going to define Q of i to be once again R of x i y i, because it looks like from this particular experience. The way we figure out you know, the entire Q row has to do with the values of the X and the Y. It does not depend on anything else. Does that make sense? Okay, all right. And we'll later on figure out what R is. Um, and then D of I is the R of QI, TI this time, but not KI, but TI, because it looks like in order to figure out the last row, which is the D row, uh, we only need to rely on the Q and the T bits of the same column. And it looks like it's the same mechanism that we use to determine the Q digits. So that's why D is R of Q, I, T, I. It's also called a single digit difference. Okay, Instead of single digit sum, now we have a single digit difference between two individual digits. So once again, the difficult one is t of i plus 1. So now we want to take a look at how did we figure out t of i plus 1. So I'm going to pick a different color. We'll start with red. Okay. So this 0 is given. Okay. Let me show you which one we're talking about. This one is given. So we are not concerned about how we got that 0 because it's one of the input to the entire system. This 0, on the other hand, is because there are were no borrows from 9 minus 3, nor there's one from 6 minus 0. And that is the reason why we put a 0 here. So the color is indicating dependency. The 0, known as T1, is because x0 minus y0 did not need a borrow. Q0 minus T0 also did not need a borrow. Is that part OK? OK? So now we look at T2, okay, which is this bit over here. We'll switch to a different color. Let's say green. So in order to determine this particular borrow, we look at this part here. 0 minus 1, ah, that needs a borrow because 0 is less than 1. So that accounts for the 1 already. But in reality, we also need to look at this subtraction. 9 minus 0 does not need a borrow, but you know, since we already have a borrow from 0 minus 1, which is x1 minus y1, we still end up with a 1 here. And then the last one, which is going to be in blue, has to do with this one over here, which is known as t3 in this subtraction. This one is not because of 2 minus 2 needing a borrow. It has to do with 0 minus 1 needing a borrow. Are we still doing OK so far with this? Okay. If you're looking at this picture and you go like, I remember we kind of color coded stuff you know, in, in a very similar way when we talked about addition, that's great. Okay, Because you're recognizing a pattern that you have seen before. And you go like, hmm, I remember that. Okay. And it is the case, okay? It, because of the structure of how the bits depend on each other, the structure is very similar to addition. It's just a little bit different, okay? So we'll talk about that a little bit different in just a little bit. But we have to finish up the, the definition of T of i plus 1. So T of i plus 1 is some kind of B function, which is a single digit subtraction borrow. Um, we have to look at the borrow when we subtract yi from xi, but we also want to take a look at the borrow when we subtract ti from qi. So we have qi over here and then ti over here. All right, so when you look at the definitions, okay, when you look at the definitions on the right-hand side, you go like, hmm, that looks awfully similar to the equations or the definitions for a multi-digit you know, addition, you go like, 
then I'm going like, yes, they are indeed very similar. Okay, not exactly the same. Okay, what are the, what are the differences? So this is one of the things that you know I encourage all of you to do is when you recognize certain things to be similar but not exactly the same, what is the follow up question? What is the natural follow up question when you say hmm, these two things are very similar? Look at the differences and also look at the similarity. How are they similar and how are they different? And then you want to be very exact about that. So in this case, the similarity has to do with QI depends on XI, YI, okay? DI depends on QI, TI, and the T of I plus one depends on everything in the previous column. So if you were to replace the D of I with S of I, you go like, Hmm. And the T of I, you know, instead of the K, uh, K of I, instead of T of I, you, we have the addition, you know, definitions. If you replace the B with a C, the T with a K, then we have the same equation as in addition. So that means we are looking at exactly the same structure. It's just that the way we define these functions, the R and the B, would be different. Are we doing okay so far with this? Okay, all right, excellent. So the next thing we need to do is to say, okay, let's let's try to figure out what is the R function doing in this case, and what is the B function doing here, and how do we define those functions? All right, so we look at a few examples. I will ask you guys to tell me what is R of three, five in this case, okay? So we're only considering subtraction. What is the single digit difference between three, five? Or when I subtract 5 from 3, what is the single digit difference? Eight. It's 8. Very good. Because you know, 3 is less than 5, so in order to get the 8, we have to add a 10 to it first, and then subtract a 5 from 13 in this case, so we get 8. Very good. And then what would be B of 3, 5? So this is the borrow of, do we need a borrow when we subtract 5 from 3? What is the answer? One. It will be one. So the answer is yes, we do need to borrow. Okay, very good. So we'll just go through maybe two more examples and then we'll move ahead and to actually define the functions. Uh, what, what if I were to flip that? If I were to subtract three from five, what would be the single digit difference? That's an easy one. It's two because I don't even have to add a 10 first because three is less than or equal to five to begin with. So we just have to do the usual subtraction, and that's it. What about the B of 5, 3? Zero. That would be a 0. Very good. So you look at this and go like, hmm, that's a really kind of different compared to addition, because addition is commutative, but subtraction is not. So you can look at how R of something can be different from the R of those two things, but transpose, okay, or with the values exchanged. All right, so we'll have just one more, okay, just to be sure. What about uh, 4, 4? R of 4, 4 is 0. zero. And then the B of 4, 4 zero. is also a 0. Excellent. So we got this. Okay. Well, using examples to illustrate something is one thing, but it's a very essential step. When you're learning something new, okay, when you need to write a program, it is important to know how to do it by hand for specific examples. So I'm teaching you techniques that, are, that can go way beyond the scope of this class. It's a general approach of how to understand something and how to solve problems. Specific examples, okay? You, have, you need to have examples. But, but once we have these examples, then we have to derive the actual equation. So I'm just going to define your new R of UV because I don't want to use x, y, that can lead to some confusion. So if I were to use a mathematical definition, what do you think that would look like? And by the way, there are multiple possible solutions. We just need one that works. Okay, so. So right here, on the fly, how do you solve this problem? We have a few, we have two distinct cases, or so it would seem, right? One case is when u is less than v, and then the other case is when u is not less than v. So it seems like they are treated slightly differently. That's one way to look at it. 
The second way to look at this is, hmm, we can use mod, okay? We can always end up with something that's way bigger than what we need, and then we just mod it to get to the value that we need. So that's a, that's the second way to look at it. So which, how do you want, how do you think we should define R of U, V? Okay. That, yep. So you add 10 to U first. Then you subtract V. But in that case, if U and V are both zeros, then you end up with a 10. And 10 is not a proper answer because 10 is not a value that can be represented by a single digit in base 10. So what do we need to do in those cases? You could do that, but I can continue with this approach. We'll get to your approach next. So in this approach, what do we need to do? Mod 10, exactly. Okay, so you can take the whole thing and just say, let's mod 10, and then that will make sure that whatever result we end up with is between 0 and 9. Now we go for the other approach. So the other approach is to first figure out... Um, mm-hmm. So what is the condition? Um, if, so if u is less than v, mm -hmm. okay. then we add 10 to it. We add 10 first before yeah. we do the subtraction. OK, so we say 10. Otherwise, we don't have to do a single thing, because otherwise, u is not less than v. So you go like, but Tech, where are you going with this? This we, we don't want to return with a 10 or a 0. That is correct. We can do it that way. So we use a ternary expression to determine, are we adding 0 first, or are we, are we adding 10 first to, to u? Then we subtract v from it. I mean, obviously, this is just one of many ways to express exactly the same logic. Um, some people can say, well, why don't you, you know, do the plus u minus v inside here and also another one over here? Well, because that would be replication. Anytime you have duplicate of something, like copy and paste, you have to ask yourself, can I clean this up so that we don't have a replica of something? Okay, because you know, every time you see duplication of something, whether it's an expression, statements, you know, a whole block of code and whatnot, it is basically screaming at you and go like, please simplify me. Why is that important? Why is copy and paste a, I wouldn't say a no-no, but it's kind of like not effective in programming. Why is that the case? Well, in terms of efficiency, it's actually okay because um, the compiler can usually figure that out, at least in some cases, in the case of expressions, and it can help simplify the code and make it efficient. So, but yeah, in many other cases, the compiler cannot optimize by itself, so it is not efficient. But there's a more important reason why we do not want to use copy and paste when we write programs. What if the code that you copy from has a flaw to begin with? You replicate it 20 times, and now you have 20 copies of the flawed code. You go like, but that's okay. You know, I can fix one. I can, if I can fix one, I can fix the other 20. Yes, you can. But do you remember where those 20 copies are? Okay? I mean, you may remember, like, two minutes after the fact, like, copy and paste 20 times, what about two weeks later, two months later, two years later, two decades later? You probably cannot remember all 20 occurrences of those copy and paste. So that means you can fix a few of those occurrences, but then the rest will still be lingering around, and then you still have to catch those things as they happen. But if you make a single function, even though it is the same flaw, you fix it once, in, it's all done. Okay, so that's the reason why we do not want to copy and paste. And whenever you know, we can avoid duplicating code, we want to do that. All right. 
So, so we got one done, okay? So we'll do the other one. What about B of UV? In other words, uh, whether the subtraction of U minus V requires a borrow or not. This one is like super easy. Go ahead. There we go. If u is less than v, let's return a 1. Otherwise, return a 0. That would do it. All right. So looking at everything on the projector right now, do we have any questions? Because we have just defined the relationship and the dependency between all the digits in a multi-digit subtraction. You look at this, and if you say, with the exception of how we define R and B, otherwise it's like, I think we have done something like this like two weeks ago. And you'll be right, okay? Because that's exactly how we set up addition. It's just that the way we define the functions were a little bit different. All right, so are we ready to move on? Yes? Okay, excellent. And do you think this is important in the exam? And what do we do when we see something that might be important in the exam? It is rather clean and simple. I mean, just a bunch of definitions. What do we do with that? Practice them. Hmm? Uh, practice them. Well, practice, and you want to put it in your own notes. Yeah. Because you're, you are basically working on your own study guide as we go. Okay, you know, we don't we don't create a study guide like two days before the exam. Okay, we should be doing it all along when we're in this class. <coughs> all right, so we are ready to move on. Okay, almost, almost ready. Because the only thing is, but tech, aren't you going to talk about base two? This is all in base 10. What do you think of that remark? How, how do we... Fix this to to work with base two. Exactly. And how many places do we have the ten? I mean, that's kind of a trick question because you know we have some alternative ways of doing it. So what I'll do is I'm just going to highlight you know, those tens that we need to change to a two. Okay. Here's one. Here's another one. And here's another one. Okay. So those are the three places where the ten appears. So, which means if you want to do, if you want to perform base two multi-digit subtraction, all we need to do is to change the R function so that all the occurrences of ten become twos. The structure stays the same. How Q of I relate to X I Y I stays the same. How the how uh, D I relies on Q I and T I stays the same. And how we determine T of I plus one from everything other than D of I in the previous column, stays exactly the same. Is that okay? All right. Going once, going twice. This train is going down the slope a little faster now. Just keep that in mind. I think I need to find a YouTube video of runaway train you know, going down the slope. And they just kind of keep playing segments of that video in this class. It's like, yeah, we're getting to that speed now. You might want to slow it down a little bit. <clears throat> Tap the brakes, as they say. All right. So assuming there are no questions, we're going to move on to base 2 subtraction. I'm just thinking, you know, whether I should... Yeah, I'll try that. Let's see if that works. So I'm going to try to copy this entire section. Okay. Let's do it one more time. Okay. And I want to do a copy. So this looks like copy. Does that look like copy to you? We'll, we'll, we'll give it a try. It said copy the clipboard, so it looks like it's going to work. And then we get to here, and then we're going to paste it. Looks like this is paste. 
and looks like I can even change where I want to paste it. Excellent. All right. And then we go back to shape, and then we'll we'll erase the tens. Okay, we'll basically just erase all the tens and replace the tens with twos, just so that we can practice you know base two subtraction by hand a few times. So this is two, this is two, and this is two. Whew. Okay, well that doesn't seem too hard. So now we'll do base two, base two subtraction. Okay, we'll do it by hand a few times, but once at least. So we have a zero one zero zero minus. Um, we'll put a zero here, a one over here, a zero over here, and then another one over here. Okay, I'm just pulling numbers out of thin air right here, and this is a base two subtraction. Okay, so we got x, we got y, we got q, t, and then d, like so. This one is assume zero. Okay, so we have the same structure as before, but this time is in base two. So the first thing is, uh, I want to figure out all the q of i's first. Okay, so let's go ahead and figure out q zero. Okay, q zero goes here. So you look at the relationship. It's like, okay, so q zero is the r of x zero, y zero which is 2 plus, okay, depending on which one you're looking at, I'm going to use the top one. So it's 2 plus u, which is a 0, minus v, which is a 1. So we end up with 2 minus 1, which is a 1. 1 mod 2 is a 1. So that's a 1. Are we okay so far? Does everybody understand how we got that 1 as q0? Okay? We are just following the definitions. What about q of 1? Q of 1 is an easy one, or we, so we think. So the Q of 1 goes here, okay? So the question is, how do we figure out Q of 1? Well, we plug in the values, okay? As much as you guys know already, 0 minus 0 is a 0. We want to apply the functions, okay? Because this is what we are practicing. So we have U being 0, uh, V is also a 0. So we plug those two zeros over here. So we have 2 plus 0, which is a 2. 2 minus 0 is also a 2, but 2 mod 2 is a 0. So that is the reason why we end up with a 0 here. Is that okay? All right? The next one is going to be a 1. This is going to be a 1. And then now we have to figure out the more difficult row, which is the t. So the t is defined to be b of xi yi plus b of qi yi in order to figure out what is t i plus 1. So this particular bit is t of 1, which means i needs to be a 0. So we need to figure out what is b of x0 y0 and what is the b of q0 t0. So when you look at the b of x0 y0, we look at the b. Um, so x0 is a 0, y0 is a 1. So we have a 0 here and a 1 over here. 0 is less than 1. It's true. So we return the value of true. When it is true, it is a 1. So um, And then we have to add to it the B of QI, TI. Um, QI or Q0 in this case is a 1. T0 in this case is a 0. So we plug those values in here. U is a 1. V is a 0 this time. 1 is less than a 0 is false. So we return a 0. So this entire right-hand side of the, of the addition is a 0, but the entire left-hand side is a 1. 1 plus 0 is a 1, so we put a 1 over here. That's a, that's a very long, spelled-out, tedious way of actually figuring out what t of 1 should be. So once you get used to this, you go like, oh, okay, I think we can get this. Um, because the b of 0, 0 is going to be a 0, the b of 0, 1 is going to be a 1. This is going to be the 0 plus 1, which is a 1 over here. And then we move on to this one over here. Okay, one, um, The b of 1, 0 is a 0. The b of 1, 1 is a 0. 0 plus 0 is a 0. The b of 0, 1 is a 1. The b of 1, 0 is a 0. 1 plus 0, once again, is a 1. And then we go you know, to the d row. And then those are the R functions. The R of 1, 0 is a 1. The R of 0, 1 is a 1. The R of 1, 1 is a 0. The R of 1 and a 0 is a 1. That's the answer. Okay, so, but did I make a mistake in the process? 
because I just kind of rushed through a lot of the calculations. Okay? So there are a few things you can do, okay? You can jot it down in your notes. First of all, okay, you might want to go through this entire process, but slow down and actually apply the functions in the, in the tedious way, okay? In, when I first started off this whole thing, it was a tedious kind of process. You might want to do that at least once or twice, just so that you know how the numbers, or how the digits are calculated. So that's one thing you might want to jot down. It's like, hmm, as an exercise for myself, I want to work this one out, you know, carry out all the calculations. The second thing is, the attack can make a mistake. How do we know whether he made a mistake or not? So I'm not telling you this is a foolproof way, you know, but this is a way to do it. And it we can also practice base conversion in the process. So I want to figure out what is the value represented by 0, 1, 0, 0 in base 2. What would that be? In other words, I'm looking at the value of x because x as a binary number is 0, 1, 0, 0, but what value is it representing? So now you have to remember base conversion, right? So what is 0, 1, 0, 0 in base 2? What value is it representing? 4, very good. I like that. Okay, so x is 4. What about y? It's a 9, very good. So the 4 is because we have none of 1, none of 2, 1 of 4, and none of 8. Okay? And then the 9 is because we have 1 of 1, none of 0, none of 4, and 1 of 8. 8 plus 1 is a 9. Okay? So you look at this subtraction, you go like, hmm, that's supposed to be the answer. But what answer did I get instead? Okay? So when you look at this D here, what is 1, 0, 1, 1 in base 2. What value is it representing? 11. Okay. So this is 11. So 4 minus 9 equals to 11. What? Wait. There's an overall borrow. Okay. There's an overall borrow over here. It is T4. It's, there's a 1 and it is T4. What is that representing? I have an overall borrow. But it's borrowing 16. Very good. Because it is T4. 2 to the power 4 is 16. So that means, oh, okay, we owe 16. So now the answer is like, yep, we got it. Because 4 minus 9 has the same result as 11 minus 16. Now, is this a verification that the method always works? The answer is no. But it helps to validate that at least for this example, it would appear that I did not make a mistake. All right. So do we have any questions about this particular example? Okay. So if you're thinking, okay, I get all the ideas, but I really kind of need to practice a little bit before I feel comfortable with it, how do you generate examples for yourself to practice? Because that's one of the things that can really help you in college level classes is do not rely on the professor to give you homework assignments. How do you give yourself homework assignments? Go ahead. Okay. Well, phase two is what we really need to get to. So, but yes, you can also do it in multiple bases. But how do you practice when you don't even know what value you should be using for those practice? Randomly, randomly generate questions. Yes, okay, I like that idea. How do you randomly generate questions? Bunch of zeros and ones, okay? But you want it to be within a certain range, okay? Like in base 2 with four digits, you can only go from 0 to 15. So how do you make sure that your random number stays within that range? What tool do you want to use? Do you want to use a calculator? Do you want to rely on coin flips, okay? Because you know, with zeros and ones, you can actually just take out the coin and flip it like four times. Here is your first number. Flip it another four times, here's your second number. 
Okay, you can do that. Okay, so you can do it without even the computer because you can just do a flip, coin flip, write down the number on a piece of paper, do exactly what I did. Okay, carry out the subtraction using the base two definition. Get to the result. Do a base conversion of each number into base ten because we are familiar with base ten, and check to see if your difference is correct. That is something that you can do rather easily too. I might add, because I mean the difficult part is most of us don't have coins to flip anymore. I would expect in ten years, if I continue to teach, people will ask me, "What is a coin? What is money?" I mean. Money to me is like just taking my smart you know, watch and go like, that's money. <laughs> they won't even know what a credit card is. It's just like I tell I try to tell you guys what is what a cassette tape is. You know that's the only way to play music in a car. You go like, what is a cassette tape? Yep, technology changes, and that really kind of changes how we do things. Now I do want to introduce one more tool. It is very helpful, but you know whether you want to learn how to use it, it's entirely up to you. Okay, I'll show you just an example. Okay, it's starting up. There we go, and it's zoom all the way out. Okay, there we go, and I'll show you here. It's a spreadsheet. So a spreadsheet has a random number generator, so it can basically generate your your random numbers. Um, it can also do base conversion. Okay, you can convert any value to base 16, base 8, and base 2 at least. Okay, and you can also perform all kinds of operations using a spreadsheet. So this is another way. It's a tool for you to kind of do more practice. Is to learn how to use a spreadsheet. <clears throat> a spreadsheet is going to be useful regardless. You know, in many many other ways. But you know, that's one way to do it. Okay. So assuming that we are okay at this point, you know, just you know, kind of need a few more, you know, practice questions and whatnot. But you know how to generate your own practice questions now. Okay, so please do that because that's one way to study. All right. So now that we know this, we're going to go like, yeah, but tech, this is not really going to help us. Even though we have the R and the B function now that can work with base two. All of these are arithmetic operations. Less than is a comparison. It is quote unquote arithmetic. Addition, subtraction, uh, and we still have a comparison here. Comparison is basically a subtraction in disguise, um, but nonetheless, it's still an arithmetic operation. It cannot be done using logic gates. So the next question is: um, I think we want to do the same thing that we did. In addition, is basically we want to translate all of these operations, all of these operations here, into base two, not base two, sorry, logical operators or Boolean operators. So that's what we're going to do next. Okay. So the next slide is going to take a quick look at. All right. So u, v are independent variables. I want to look at r of u, v in base two, and b of u, v in base two. But because we're dealing with base two, each one can only take on two possible values, which is zero and one. So now, once again, we have a truth table that has four rows. All right. So what about R of U V? R of zero zero in this case. What do you think that's going to be? Well, that's an easy one. Zero minus zero has a result of zero. Zero minus one has a result of one. One minus zero has a result of one. And then one minus one has a result of zero. Go like, hmm. Vaguely familiar. Okay, we'll we'll get to that. What of the what about the borrow? Zero minus zero does not have a borrow. Zero minus one has a borrow. One minus zero does not have a borrow. One minus one also does not have a borrow. So now you look at this truth table, and it will work out. You know, well. I think in this class we'll work out try we'll try to work out b of u v first. So now we look at b of u v and you ask, how can we come up with these same zeros and ones without using comparison, with only using logical operators? Logical operators mean exclusive or,、uh, and not or. Okay, those are the ones that we have introduced in this class. 
So you look at this column, you go like, there's only one row. Only one row of the four rows, you know, this particular row here, has a result of one. And in that situation, u is false and then v is true. So given that u is false and v is true, how do I come up with a logical expression that is guaranteed to be a one, but only for this row? For all the other three rows, it should be a zero. You go like, hmm, I think this might work. If I negate u first and then do a conjunction with v, let's see if that works. Okay, so we work out all the four rows, all four rows. So whenever v is a zero, the whole thing has to be zero because of the conjunction. So we go like, okay, well, that's an easy one for this, for these two. And then for the last row, even though v is a one, u is a one too. But since we negate u before we do the conjunction, so that means that's going to be a zero over here as well. So with the second row, on the other hand, v is a one, so we have the right-hand side of the conjunction being true, but since u itself is false, but we have to negate it first before we do the conjunction, so that turns the false into a true before the conjunction. So by the time we have the conjunction, we have one and one, which is a one. Oh, problem solved. Because now we can say, hmm, b of uv for base two only can also be done using the negation of u and v itself. One problem solved. But what about the other one? Aren't we supposed to be dealing with R2? The answer is exclusive R. Exclusive R, because it's exactly the same. If you look at the R function in binary subtraction, it is exactly the same as the R function in addition. So we have already talked about that. It's done already. So we can now say, oh, OK, that makes it easy. R of uv is just u exclusive or with v. Done. Cool. Are we still doing okay so far? Cool. All right. So we still have a problem. Okay. It is not about whether we can use logic gates to get things done, it is about the dependency of t of i plus 1 and t of i. In other words, I can only figure out what is t of 4 once I have figured out what is t of 3. But I can only figure out what is t of 3 once I have figured out what is t of 2, and so on. So we still have that linear dependency. And in your mind, you can kind of go like, oh, so that means you know, we can construct a circuit right now. It's called a borrow ripple bor uh, subtractor. Okay, Instead of a carry ripple adder, we just change a few words, okay? So the carry becomes a borrow, and then the uh, adder becomes a subtractor. But it, it's going to look almost exactly the same, okay? It still has that problem of linear dependency. So the question is, hmm, so how do we solve that linear dependency problem? How do we solve that problem with addition? What is the term that we use to call the circuit or the design that gets around the linear dependency problem. Just a name. I don't need you to recite here what is what a, what the individual bits are defined. What is the name of the mechanism that we used to solve the problem of carry rippling? Start with the L. Carry look ahead. Yep, carry look ahead. So in this case, we also have a same, you know, similar technique of borrow look ahead. So for that, I'm going to switch back to my notes because there's another long derivation here. <laughs> this time, I'm, I'm going to skip the entire discussion of the derivation. Once again, if you have taken 440 already, you should be able to follow the derivation itself because that's what 440 is supposed to teach. But since this is not 440, I will show you the derivation. The reason why I have these derivations is because until I can perform the derivation myself, I do not feel comfortable teaching it. Okay, It's kind of note to self in a way, but at the same time, if you can go back and go like, hmm, I wonder what I have learned in 440. Let me see if I can understand the derivation. That's also a practice for you.
Okay. What about the thought of, well, I took 440 already, but why do I want to go back and re-examine all the things that I've learned in 440? That does not seem to be a good use of my time. So what, what do you think of that thought? Are you going to land a $120,000 job right after you graduate from ARC? You wish. <laughs> I'll just be dead honest with you, you wish. But it's not going to happen. Okay, so what is the next step? Once you get your bachelor's degree, once you have finished your transfer requirement, what are you going to do? You transfer, right? So what do you think happens after you transfer to a four-year university? I have two more years of GE classes and I'm done. Is that going to happen? Is that how you go through those extra two years at a four-year university? So what do you do instead? Sorry? Upper division, yes. So you're going to take the upper division of computer science classes. Because community colleges such as ARC can only, by law, teach lower division classes. Okay? So all of these things will come back. And depending on which university you transfer to, um, some professors may, you may not even get into a class that is taught by a professor. Yeah, look at me go like, what do you mean by not a professor? Because in certain universities, which I will not name, professors were hired based on how good they are in research. And many of the professors who are exceptional in researching do not like to teach. So every day, they drag their feet to the classroom, they open up the textbook, they just read the textbook to you. That is how they teach. So just a little preview of what you can expect, okay? You know, after you get your transfer degree here. Anywho, this doesn't solve the problem. T of i plus one, after all this work, is still depending on T of i. We solved that problem before, didn't we? Except this time, okay, it's also very important, okay? So you might want to write down this definition for binary subtraction, okay? Make sure that you phrase it exactly the way I said, for binary subtraction. G of i is now defined as the negation of x of i and y of i. P of i is now defined as the negation of x of i or y of i. You go like, but isn't that almost the same as how we define G of i and P of i for addition? Yes, almost, except we negate x of i first. Okay? So when I said you write it down, I really meant writing it down will help you. Okay? Because it's not going to help me in any way. I'm going to grade the exams exactly the same way, but I think it will help you to you know, kind of note the differences between binary addition and binary subtraction. Okay. So once we define g of i and p of i this way, what do we get? Oh, so the first term you know, to the left of the uh, disjunction of the or is now just g of i, okay. And then this whole thing that we do with t of i, the, the whole thing that we're ending with t of i is simply a p of i. So t of i plus one, okay, let me point to the equation that we're looking at right now. So t of i plus one is now redefined as g of i or the conjunction of p of i and t of i. And then at this point, if you are looking at this and go like, that's exactly the same structure that we saw with k of i plus one when we worked on binary addition. If you recognize that, good job, okay? Because that's what we are looking for, okay? We're looking for patterns, okay? Um, and side I'm going to sidetrack just a little bit here. Being a successful developer or a computer science person is about extracting patterns. Noticing pattern, comparing you know, two things, 
and noticing what are similar, what is similar between those two things, and what is different between those two things. What is similar becomes the structure of an expression, of a function, of a data structure. What is different becomes the parameters, because those are the things that can be different. So they have to be input into the structure that is common. So that's basically what we do. And that's also coincidentally what IQ tests are usually about. They give you pictures of some patterns, and then they ask you, what do you think is the next one? Most IQ tests consist of patterns like that. Can anyone guess what the IBM programmer proficiency test look like? Because IBM used to have a proficiency test, so they can assess the, um, the aptitude of people you know, in order to see whether they fit in a development team. Do you know what it's going to look like? Or what it looked like because it's a thing of the past. Yes. <clears throat> exactly. That is how IBM assess people to see whether they fit in the programmer, you know, um, category. So I'm, I'll just do a quick search here. You know, you guys can do the same. You just look up IBM programmer uh, aptitude test. Okay, there we go. And there are images. Unfortunately, there's no digital form of that. But you can look through these, and there we go. Okay, some people actually took the test, and then they go. These are numbers, and then they also have you know non-number questions like you know these. So they are basically patterns. Okay, so you might want to kind of spend some time to look at these, and I'm going to tell you one thing, which you know, may or may not be true because I'm not a psychologist. I don't think IQ is boring, okay? I think it really comes with a lot of practice. It's just that some of us has a lot of really, really early practice, so we become proficient you know, earlier. And other people, you know, if they put enough time and effort into it, can still develop the same ability. So there's probably a little bit of intrinsic you know, aptitude, but I think for the most part, it comes with practice. It's just that, you know, is that practice going to look like you're having fun or you're, you have to drag your feet through the practice? So that's just my opinion. So with this, we can now say, hmm, so we can use that really ugly thing that we talked about in addition. Remember this thing here? This is exactly the same. Okay, I, I did not put parentheses around these two, which I really should. But, you know, other than that, it's exactly the same thing. So that means if you want to figure out what is T of 3, just look at K of 3. Replace every mentioning of K with T, you're done. It's that easy. So do we have any questions? I think the train is going at 70 miles per hour now downhill. And still accelerating. No, no questions. We're still good. Okay, all right. So with this all done, we are moving on to the next module. So you can see that I'm really just going through the module one by one. And before we do that, we'll take a short break taking roll. You cannot see it yet. Uh, the roll is XYQTD. And then I'm just going to publish it now. You should be able to refresh and see it. But we might have passed the time already. So let, I have to change the time, sorry. That's my fault. All right, so we have to change the time to, I'll just push, push it all the way to 11.50. That should give us plenty of time. So there we go. The time is 11.50. I mean, you have until that time to type in this access code and go in and say that you are in, in class today. So once again, the access code is XYQTD, which are the names or the labels of each row when we perform subtraction. So we are good? Okay, all right, excellent.
All right. So with that done, the train is continuing to roll downhill. And we are moving on to the next one, which is signed versus unsigned integer representation. I'm not sure how much we can go over in this particular module, but we'll just go ahead and take a look. Okay. All right, so the first question is, let's deal with unsigned representation first. How many bits do we assign to an integer in C or C++? That's the first question. So when you declare a type as unsigned int, how many bits does it have? Or the better question is, how do we find out? Hmm? Exactly. You can do a size of. Then very good. So size of is an operator. You know, it's actually called an operator. Very strange, okay, because it doesn't look like an operator. But size of is an operator in C, C++, and it returns the number of bytes for a particular type. So you can plug in any type. You can also plug in a variable, a parameter. It will tell, it will tell you what how many bytes it's going to take. So instead of using you know size of, which I can, let me see if I can. Uh, yeah, I can do it that way. But the easier way is to use GDB or the debugger, because in a debugger you can just say print, because it is aware of the syntax of C++. So you can just say what is the size of unsigned, and it says it's four. Four of what? Four bits? Four individual digits? No. Four bytes. Very good. So how many bits do we have in four bytes? Thirty-two, because one byte is eight bits. So how do we call four bits? A nibble. A nibble. Very good. Okay, you know the you know your your computer science terms. So one single binary digit is called a bit because it is a B binary digit. The IT you know is where the IT is coming from. So it's BIT, which is a bit. So they call four bits a nibble. And then 8 bits is a byte with a Y instead of an I. But I think they stop there. So, you know, 16 bit is not called a chomp. <laughs> All right, so that's kind of cool. So now we want to estimate how big of a number can I represent using a unsigned integer in this particular environment. Now, by the way, whether an unsigned is exactly for bytes or 32 bits depends on the compiler. It depends on the platform. So if you are to try to do something like this in uh, with an Arduino, which is a small embedded system, it will say 16 or 2 bytes, okay, 16 bits. If you were to do this with a larger you know, platform, a, a bigger architecture, it might, six, it might say 8 or 8 bytes, which is 64 bit. So this number is not guaranteed to be a 4. Because the C++ standard does not specify the width of an unsigned. It is platform or architecture dependent. Okay, so let's say it's four bytes. So what is approximately, I don't need you to give me the exact number, approximately how big of a value can I store in a unsigned before I run out of values? I don't know exactly, but it would be to the 32nd, 30 to the 32nd, that is correct. But how do we estimate, okay, and convert it back to values that we are familiar with, like thousands, millions, that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. So let me show you a trick. Okay, so we're going to use, yeah, we can use another page here. So we look at 2 to the power 32, which is, um, well, okay, technically you have to subtract 1. That's the largest value they can represent. Why we have? To, why do we have to subtract one? Okay, there are two ways to look at this. One is you look at one, 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 thirty-two ones, and then you add up all those powers of two, which means you are adding one, two, four, eight, sixteen, and so on until you get to two to the power of thirty-one. Then you end up with two to the power of thirty-two minus one. That's one way to do it. The second way to do it is to ask, oh. But zero is going to take up one representation, right? So that means 
for non-zero values, we can only go up to this value. So there are two ways to look at this, okay? But we're just going to say, yeah, but for approximation purposes, it's close enough to 2 to the power 32, because we're only missing 1 over 2 to the power 32, which is not a big deal. So we look at this and go like, hmm, but how do we do the estimation here? So the trick to do this is to say 1,024, which is 2 to the power of 10, is approximately 1,000, which we are familiar with. Okay, so now we look at this and go like, hmm, this is exactly 2 to the power of 10, that whole thing to the power of 3 times 2 to the power of 2. Are we okay with this math here? Okay, so exponents, you know, that sort of math is super important in computer science, okay? So we can... Ouch, ouch. Ooh. I'm okay, but I'm not sure about the table or the desk. So now we have this, and you will go like, well, that is approximately 1,000 to the power of 3 times 2 to the power of 2. Is that okay? Because this is the step to make things a little bit easier for us to say. So what is 1,000 to the power of 3? It is called A. 1,000 is 1,000. 1,000,000 1, is a million. 1,000 million is a billion, okay? So now we say, oh, okay, so this whole thing is 4 billion. Is it exactly 4 billion? Is 2 to the power of 32 minus 1 exactly 4 billion? No. But for estimation purposes, it's close enough. So this is a nifty trick to find out how many to do a base conversion from base 2 to base 10, and at least to understand the magnitude that we are talking about. Okay. How many people have taken 440? Since I kept, kept talking about 440 or 430. Okay, a few. So you have, you have been exposed to binary search, right? Your binary search is a technique to look for an item in a sorted array. So in binary search, every time you go through an iteration, you eliminate one half of the possibilities. World population is approximately 8 billion now. So how many iterations do you have to go through in binary search to confirm that a particular record does not exist? It does not match a person. 33, exactly. Because 2 to the power of 33 is 8 billion. Okay, And base 2 is kind of working... It's similar to what we're talking about here because we are talking about how many times do I have to divide 8 billion by 2 until I get to 1, which is the reverse of what we just did. So in 33 comparisons, you can find that a particular ID does not exist in an array of 8 billion records. Okay, you guys do not seem particularly excited about the power of binary search. I'll just say that it is, it's, it's really, it's really interesting because you know, if world population is to double again, you just add one iteration. If world population becomes 16 billion, then in 34 comparisons, you can narrow down for sure to the one that you were looking for or confirm it does not exist. Okay, so this is what I'm, what I'm doing is not trying to distract you. I'm trying to relate topics between different classes. So hopefully this will help you kind of gel not only the concepts that you're learning in this class, but also concepts that you have learned or will learn from your other classes. If you don't like this, you'll text me, email me, and let me know and, and just say, text, I do not need distractions in this class. All right. So, okay, all right, but this is unsigned. In other words, we can only represent values that are not negative, okay? So from zero all the way up to you know, a little more than four billion, that, those are the values they can represent using an unsigned. So it is great, okay? But occasionally we need to represent values, you know, integers that are negative. So the question is, how do we do that? Well, you have to remember the notation that you're used to, like this is 4, and it is negative 4, 
This notation is meaningless when you only have zeros and ones inside the computer. So you can go like, well, maybe we can just use a sign bit, okay, right? So we can use one bit dedicated to indicate the sign of the rest of the bits. Well, that's a possible way of doing things, but it's not a very handy thing of doing things. Because if you were to do things that way, your adder, the subtractor circuit, is not going to work with signed numbers anymore. You need a few more steps to do the conversion, which, is, which turns out to be completely unnecessary. So we'll go ahead and just introduce the, uh, a few equations here, and then we'll probably come back and talk about those again. So I'm going to use VU for unsigned value of a bit pattern X. And then VS, which is a signed interpretation of a bit pattern X. And then these two are two, part, two equations. The unsigned one is easy because we have seen this one already. It is the sigma or the summation where I start from the least significant bit, in this case, 0, to n minus 1, where n, okay, so we have, excuse me, I, I messed up here. <laughs> There's a second parameter n here, which is to say interpret up to n bits, okay? So we have a bit pattern x, which may have an infinite number of digits, but we're only interpreting up to n of those bits. So n is one of the parameters to these functions. So I, I do apologize that I forgot about that, because if you're taking notes, you know, then you have to kind of go back and fix it a little bit here. But the rest of this is like, okay. I think we have seen this before. Have we seen this before? That's when we talk about base conversion. You know, we look at the value. So as it turns out, okay, that one is a straight copy from the base conversion you know, module. And if, you know, for anyone who may not even exist in this class, but for anyone who look at this sigma notation and do not feel that we have talked about that notation before, you, you know, that person needs to go back and really review the material that is on Canvas, okay? You know, because we have definitely talked about that before. So when you look at the sign interpretation, it's almost the same. Sigma i goes from 0 to n minus 2 this time. So it is not a typo. This is supposed to be n minus 2. So we are taking into consideration one fewer bit in the sigma notation. But the to terms that we're adding, it's still exactly the same. So the question is, but Tech, you promised that we're gonna use n of those bits. This is only using n minus one bits because from zero to n minus two, you only have n minus one bits. So what are we gonna to do to bit n minus one, okay? We do a subtraction with that one. n minus one times two to the power of n minus one. That's it. This is the difference. Unsigned interpretation, signed interpretation of a bit pattern. All right. Let's take a look. Okay. So we can say, what if we're looking at 1, 0, 1, 1 in base 2? Okay. So we want to figure out what is VU, 1011 in base 2, interpret up to 4 bits. We, we, we want to look at the signed interpretation of exactly the same bit pattern. Okay. VU is easy to do because we just need to add up all the things, right? 1 of 1, 1 of 2, none of 4, 1 of 8. Add them up, what do we get? We saw this earlier in class 2. 11, very good. What about the second one? Well, the second one I'm going to spell out a little bit. We have 1 of 1, we have 1 of 2, we have none of 4, and we have 1 of 8. But 1 of 8 is the problem. Well, it's not a problem, it's the exception. Because n is 4, 4 minus 1 is a 3. So digit 3, which is this one here, is not part of the sigma. It is outside of the sigma, and then we use this product, but we're subtracting that from the sigma. 
In other words, the eight is not being added to the rest of the sum. It is being subtracted from the rest of the sum. So in this case, we have one plus two minus eight, which is what? Negative five. In other words, depending on how you look at it, or what you need, how you want to interpret, one zero one one can mean the value of eleven. What we know as eleven, we can all it can also be used to represent what we know as a negative five. Okay? The first thing people do respond to this is, so which one is it? If I see the bit pattern of one zero one one. What exactly is it? And my answer to that question may seem a little bit okay. I'm not sure about the uh, how many of you did, did the test of the MBDI test and read up on the personality types. So my first my answer may seem very INTP, which is my type, also known as the warmest robot. My response is, why do you care? You're looking at one zero one one. Okay, you have a tiny little multimeter, and you're probing the transistors on your chip, and you go like, okay, we have a one zero one one here. The question is, the question you are asking me is, so is that a eleven or is it a negative five? My answer or my response is, why do you care? What are you doing with that one zero one one? If you're adding or if you're subtracting, it makes no difference. As it turns out, this way of doing sign interpretation can reuse everything that we have talked about in subtraction and addition. All the, the circuit that you constructed the other day still works. Not a problem. Hmm. So when does it matter? Or I should say, you know, what exactly is 1011? It may not even represent a value, okay? It may just represent, you know, one white pixel, one dark pixel, one white pixel, another white pixel. That may be what it's representing. Um, how many of you know what is a dot matrix printer? Very few, I think. Okay. But it can represent, do we have a dot on the piece of paper, not have a dot on the piece of paper, have another dot of a, on the piece of paper, another dot on the piece of paper. In which case, it is not even trying to convey a value. It is just what should, what you're printing you know, should look like. So there's no intrinsic interpretation to a sequence of zeros and ones. Until you need to do something with it, it's meaningless. There's no default interpretation of the zeros and ones. So I have just talked about all the cases where it does not matter. When does it matter? Okay. When does it matter is when you need to compare. So the question that I can pose to you is, is this pattern less than this pattern here? Then it makes all the difference. Because using the unsigned interpretation, you are comparing one to 11. 1 is less than 11 is true. We good? But if you use the signed interpretation, then you're comparing 1 against negative 5, in which case 1 is less than negative 5 is false. But until you're actually comparing, it makes no difference. You add numbers to 1011 the same way, you subtract numbers exactly the same way, and you print it out, okay? It has no default interpretation of the value. It's only when you need to compare, then it makes a difference. Should I skip the then branch and go to the else branch in the conditional statement, or should I go to the then statement? Then it makes a difference. Is that okay? So this is gonna come back about eight weeks later, because you know, then we'll actually be coding. So when we start to code, then we really have to pay attention to, is that supposed to be storing negative values or is it only going to store non-negative values only? Then it makes a difference, okay? So we are gonna have a lot more discussion of how we compare numbers based on you know, the bit pattern and a lot of logical operations. So today is more of a 
just a, your early exposure to those concepts. But the important part here, okay, let me just kind of highlight what I think is really important. This really summarizes. If I were to look at this entire module, this entire thing of signed versus unsigned integer representation, and just look at this entire thing, okay, if I were to sum it up, it would be this. These two equations, these two definitions summarizes how we look at signed versus unsigned interpretation when in base two. So given that is important, okay, you might want to jot it down, um, you know, or you can also just you know kind of take note of what time it is right now and what date we have right here, and then just write it down because that way you can always go back to the YouTube video and take a screenshot so you don't have to copy everything by hand right now. All right, so I'm done with uh, the lecture today. We covered quite a bit of material today, even though a lot of that has similarity to things that we have talked about before. Making the connection between what we talk about today to the concepts that we have learned already in the past, that is what you need to do, okay, is to make that connection in your mind. And that is not something that I can do, okay? You, know, you can only do that by understanding or you know, reviewing the material and try to make that connection. All right, so we do have a lab today, okay? We have a lab with a um, submission. So you're designing a circuit today and we are actually going into the carry look ahead circuit that we talked about last time, but we didn't actually do any actual circuit. So today's lab is right here, okay, so I'm gonna unhide it. And unlike most of the other labs, I am going to let people turn in by midnight, well, I shouldn't say that, any time today, Pacific time. <laughs> because if I say you can turn in by midnight, that can be ambiguous, because what is 0 hundred hour or 12 a.m.? If I say you can, you can turn it in at by 12 a.m., on the 11th, what does that mean? Exactly, you're all past due. Because 12 a.m. is the beginning of a day. So if I say you can turn it in any time today, that means you can turn it in by 11 p.m. 59.59, okay? This is all important because if you have a flight that takes off at 0 hundred hour, and you misunderstand which day it is, you can be missing your airplane, okay? So this is due any time today because it's a little bit longer, okay, based on the experience of the Tuesday, Thursday class. It might take a little bit longer for some people to complete. Um, so anyway, this part is the usual quiz part. This is where you turn in the actual design. Um, I really encourage everyone to try to get it done within the lab time. You don't have to, but I really encourage everyone to try to get it done within the lab time. Yes? Um, hmm? Yeah. yeah, the seventh has passed already. Today is the eleventh. I did that with, you know, uh, one of the earlier, because I, I actually you know, copied this from the other class. because I made some changes. So there we go. All right. All right, so it's up to you guys, okay? Stay here, work on it, and ask questions when I'm still here, or continue to work on it you know, once we are done with this lab time. Yep. Uh, what is the right, I forgot about that too. <laughs> All right, so the lab, the access code is 3x3 part one. I'll write it on the whiteboard. Yep. Um, the other uh, file submission part, which also has have, have it on duty. Um, yeah, I'm going to have to fix that one too. Okay. 
you know, because of um, the Monday that was a holiday to us, the Tuesday, Thursday class is now one class ahead of us. All right, so the dates of both the quiz and the submission are now updated. So I'm going back to my office. I'm going to get some uh, water and then I'll be... Thank you. 